Okay. I um, I suggest that I'll just uh, already kick it off. We have um, four participants at this point uh, in the call, and the others will uh, dribble in. Um, but with regard to uh, timing, I think it's good for us um, to now kick it off. So welcome all to this session on sports and inclusion. Um, I'm very happy and honored um, to be here today and to discuss this topic in depth with all of you. Uh, maybe some background about me. I'm Deborah van Brande. I am part of the economic affairs team at the Consulate General of the Netherlands in San Francisco. And in a previous career, I did a PhD on contemporary migration topics. So diversity and inclusion is a topic very dear to my heart. Uh, and especially I'm very fascinated by the way in which other vehicles, such as culture, or in this case sports, can actually work towards um, bridging, um, you know, to, to getting to a point of more diversity and inclusion in society in general. We have seen a few times throughout the week the importance of uh, the topic sports and inclusion. We had Nina Hachigian mentioning that the city of LA is working towards um, a more inclusive approach to make sports and venues more accessible to all. So I thought that was uh, definitely noteworthy. We've seen um, in a very different fashion in the session on VR and sports, um, how also emerging technologies can help to um, make sports more accessible and not only elevate fan experience, but also make sure that people can actually do training remotely uh, and in a more affordable way. Um, we have um, had the session on sports landscapes in the US and in the Netherlands where, um, where there was a lot to do about the concept of sports for all um, or in Dutch, Brite sport, recreational sports and how that is really at the core of um, the Dutch sports experience, how it's very important for the Netherlands to make sports um, accessible to all, how they stress um, youth programs and youth inclusion programs. And, and I'm very honored to have here today um, some of the speakers um, that, all of the speakers that have really uh, a solid, solid background in the matter. Before introducing all of them, um, I'd like to take a minute to also address the timeliness of this session. Um, as we're all aware, um, the last few uh, weeks have been um, very much uh, at the center of, um, of discussions with regard to um, racial and social um, injustice, discrimination, and have also called for a thorough investigation of institutional discrimination. Um, and I'd like to take this as a moment to also, you know, um, shed a light on what, is, what, what that has meant for us as, 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 as the Dutch government representation in uh, the United States. Following the uh, tragic death of uh, George Floyd, um, the embassy has actually called into action a workforce, a task group that is called Racial Disparities and Discrimination and that really works towards um, how we can position ourselves even better when it comes to responding to and working with um, discussions around inclusion, discrimination, diversity, and mainly also with a focus on uh, racial, uh, racial topics and racism obviously in itself. And I'm very proud to work for an employer who takes this um, matter so seriously uh, for an employer who also works towards promoting LGBTQ rights. Uh, we do pride events every year. Um, and I think um, we had to have a session on sports and inclusion in this program. It's what we represent. And I'm really, really thankful that you all made the time to join us today for this. Uh, before diving into uh, the introduction of the speakers, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the last few weeks. And I think there is no better way to do that than by sharing a brief video that Nike has launched uh, following um, the racial protests and discussions we've had the last few weeks. The ad is called Don't Do It. And Milene, um, if you would be as kind to uh, play the video right now, that would be amazing.
Thank you, Milena, for uh, sharing the video. You will all have the opportunity to react to this and to any topics that come to mind in a bit. Um, let's be all part of the change. Um, and I think that's a very inspiring uh, message uh, at this point in time. Um, I'd like to now give the to give you an overview of the speakers we have for you today. Um, the first speaker we have is Gabby Arvizu. She is the Social and Community Impact Director for LA and the West Territory at Nike. Uh, she drives and implements strategies to get and keep kids active through sports and physical activity in marginalized communities. In her last four years at Nike, she has successfully launched signature programs and partnerships such as the Mamba League with Kobe Bryant and Women Coach LA with the city of Los Angeles. She was born in Mexico and raised in LA and she's passionate about mentoring young women. So a very inclusive approach. Um, I'll give all of them the floor in a bit. The next speaker we have is Nolan Ortiz. He's a director of grants and programs at the LA 84 Foundation. He, uh, this organization is leading uh, when it comes to um, supporting youth uh, sport programs and also the roles uh, of sports and positive youth development. And he's been active at this organization uh, since 2015. Then we have Jason Barquero, who is not only um, a higher education professional, but he's also a sports public address announcer. He's currently the director um, of the Robert G. Freeman Center for Career and Completion at the Pasadena City College, College Division of Economic and Workforce Employment. Through this role, Jason leads a team of professionals that prepares uh, thousands of students um, to enter the workforce through diverse and inclusive work-based learning opportunities. And since 2014, Jason has also been a member of the LA Lakers, serving as a public address announcer for the organization's G League team, the South Bay Lakers. He was also the inaugural public address announcer in 2019 for one of LA's newest franchises, LAFC, the Los Angeles Football Club. And then last but not least, I'm happy to have Hayes de Jong on board today. He has served as the Secretary General of the Royal Netherlands Football Association since 2017 and that it's used with the abbreviation KNVB. And his past responsibilities at KNVB have included his activities at the competitions um, department. He's been responsible there for security and disciplinary matters, as well as refereeing and public affairs. In addition to his work for KNVB, Hayes has a number of international roles. He is a UEFA delegate and FIFA match commissioner and also a member of the UEFA National uh, Teams Competitions Committee. At this point, I'd like to invite all of you uh, on this call to uh, briefly unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves so that the speakers also get an idea of who you are and where sports and inclusion might play a role. I'd like to ask you all to keep it brief, five to 10 seconds maximum. And I'll start with Jorit. Hi all, um, Joert Zaltink, City of Amsterdam. Thank you, Joert. I also see our Consul General Herbert Kunst on this call. Herbert? Yeah, well, um, good morning again. Um, great to see you all and thank you so much, Deborah, for sort of um, leading here the, the way to this discussion. I think it's a very important one. You just mentioned the importance the embassy touched to this topic. And I think we would love to explore new ways of maybe setting uh, next steps. And it's it's much needed as we learned from the video, but as we all know, because we all follow the news and developments here in the States. But I think it's not only the United States, we could easily say, I think it's much more needed, much more attention is needed all over the globe. But I'm pretty sure that will be one of the topics we will discuss today. So thanks for uh, the opportunity to join you. Thank you, Herbert. We also have Afka Mak on the call, Afka Mak is uh, the co-leader of this mission, but also here to represent uh, thousands of companies. So Afke. Uh, thank you. My name is Afke Mak. I work for the Employers Association for the Dutch tech industry, where I'm responsible for everything that has to do with a built environment. And I think regarding inclusion, it's really important to note that 
uh, from our association, we focus on how can tech make the world a better place, so also a more inclusive place. So I'm very excited to uh, to hear from you experts today. Thank you. We also have Hanneke van den Pol uh, on the line. Hi, Hanneke van den Pol, Manager Games Operations, Team NL, Netherlands Olympic Committee, responsible for the all uh, logistics operations of the multi-sport events uh, we send out Team NL, so preparing for Tokyo, Beijing, Paris and LA. Thank you, Hanneke. Ruben? Hi all. Uh, my name is uh, Ruben. Uh, I'm a consultant and mainly working with two uh, public-private platforms. The one is on sports, which is called SportsNL, and the other one is Holland Circular Hotspot. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, I also see Rick Slegers. Hi, my name is Rick. I work for uh, Orange Sports Forum, and we represent uh, 300 Dutch sports-related organizations. Great, I see Hans Verhoeven. You're on mute still, Hans. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good uh, Good evening and uh, good morning. I'm Hans Verhoeven. I'm the managing director and owner of MTD. MTD is an uh, event plumber. So we make, uh, we care about water and water treatment and uh, reducing water. And uh, we have done all the Olympics since Vancouver, all venues and all Olympics. And we also would have worked in Tokyo today, but uh, unfortunately it's going to next year. And we have a company in Atlanta, so we can work from uh, the US for the next games. Thank you, Hans. Uh, I also see Hans Besseling. Yes, good evening. Hans Besseling, I'm the Managing Director of Kerstin Europe and we are supplier of uh, facade and uh, construction elements, uh, especially bent. And we have uh, been involved in many projects related to sports stadiums and civil uh, projects. Thank you. And then I also see a very familiar face, Sasha, uh, who's been uh, very helpful in putting this mission together. Sasha? Good morning, Deborah, and uh, good evening, uh, the people in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for having me, uh, Deborah. And uh, yeah, I've helped out with uh, with putting uh, uh, people in this mission on the uh, on the LA LA side. So uh, thanks uh, for for Nolan, uh, Jason, for being here. Um, looking forward to uh, to see this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then lastly, I see Leonie. But she might uh, be grabbing something for dinner really quickly. Uh, let's, We're preparing uh, dinner actually. Oh, uh, there we go. Hello to you all. Uh, but I have to take care of my family as well. So, um, but I didn't want to miss it. So I'm sorry to put out of my camera. My name is Leonie. Uh, very happy to be here again. Uh, I'm the program director of Amsterdam Smart City. And we're an urban innovation platform uh, connecting. Uh, like-minded minds with different uh, capabilities uh, in order to speed up a better world. Thank you, Leonie. Um, I'll uh, quickly, we're, we're a bit under time pressure uh, because the previous session ran longer. So we're just gonna dive in with the first question to the uh, speakers. And that is uh, what is really at the core of the uh, policy uh, at your organizations with regard to inclusion and diversity? and how it relates to sports. And I would love to give the word to Gabby uh, from Nike. Awesome, thank you so much, Deborah. And Leonie, I'm totally with you. Don't be surprised if there's a little guy that comes by to say hi to everybody. He has a habit of just doing that in all of my Zoom meetings. Um, so very nice to meet everybody. Um, you know, super excited just to um, be on this call with everyone. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think as, as the video showed and as you've seen throughout, you know, so many efforts that Nike has done, uh, we always strive to inspire athletes everywhere. You know, we try to do that through our campaigns, you know, but also we try to complement those efforts in the messages we put out into the world through efforts that we're um, leading uh, with direct and ongoing investments in our communities. And so as a purpose-driven company, our goal is to unite the world, right? We want to unite the world through sports specifically uh, to create a healthy planet, um, active communities, and an equal playing field for all. 
you know, we have a long history of speaking up for causes that really reflect our values. Uh, and we are very committed to breaking down these barriers for athletes. Uh, and that's athletes with an asterisk, you know, so anyone that has a body is an athlete is the way that we see it, you know, and so through our work with community partners. So even as a global company, um, you know, we really like to take a global approach to giving, you know, and I think especially how we serve our, our, our communities. You know, so for example, you know, we see that all kids are made to play, you know, but we also know that not every kid gets that opportunity. You know, so through our made to play commitment, we work with partners to train coaches and to provide these gender inclusive, culturally responsive and community relevant programming for kids. But yeah, we also know that there are similarities across cities in different parts of the world. And at the same time, we see that there are many challenges that are very city and sometimes even very neighborhood specific. Um, you know, so it's very important for us to really take not just this macro approach, but also a super micro um, and looking at the local level, you know, and so this is where I step in um, leading these efforts, you know, for Nike here in LA and in the West, you know, to ensure that the initiatives that we drive are in response and in service uh, to our, you know, underserved and underrepresented communities all throughout LA. Um, in addition to some of the local efforts that we drive, um, we also every year we provide until we all win grants. Um, these are grants to support nonprofits um, that are working to level the playing field uh, for communities that are reflected by our eight Nike employee networks. Um, so these are serving all, all groups um, and employees and consumers and communities, including ability, LGBTQIA, um, as well as the Black and Latinx communities, just to name a few. Um, you know, most recently, uh, you may have heard around our announcement around our $140 million commitment to support the Black community in the U.S. over the next 10 years. You know, so just super excited, uh, super honored to be a part of this, um, these initiatives uh, within Nike, but really all of us together, you know, and, and we know that this is all part of Nike's purpose. Um, and yet we know we can't stop here. We've got so much more work to do. And we know we must continue to act to help create this lasting change that addresses these systemic issues and racism that our society continues to face to this day. Uh, and we really see the power of sport and how that can really help to level the playing field for all. Thank you uh, so much. I'm sure you've raised a lot of questions already, Gabby. We'll get to those in a minute because you mentioned a lot of grant programs. So that naturally brings me to the next uh, to the next person, Nolan. Um, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in the program today. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Um, as Deborah mentioned, I am the Director of Grants and Programs at the LA84 Foundation. And so what I'd like to do is, is begin with some background and history of the organization and the work we do. Uh, we here at the LA84 Foundation, as a legacy of the 1984 Olympic Games that took place here, have a mission to transform lives and communities through our support of youth sports programs. LA84 is a sports-based youth development organization that believes in the transformational power of sport, simply stated and the impact it can have on the lives of youth to help prepare them for success in sports and in life. Among the different types of work that LA84 does, the grant making that we do supports hundreds of non-government organizations throughout Southern California every year. But that's not all. Uh, LA84 works with partners to train coaches. We convene conferences like our upcoming annual Youth Summit, and we also maintain an Olympic and sports library collection. We at LA84 are proud that we prioritize sports as a bridge to help youth to a brighter future. Uh, I'm excited about today's discussion on sports and inclusion, and I'm looking forward to sharing what LA84 is doing more specifically to help support youth sports programs here in LA. Um, this includes our focus on the LA84 Play Equity Initiative, uh, where, again, to, to summarize, we simply believe that PE, physical education, is a social justice issue. Play equity, when we talk about it, we're referring to play equity meaning fairness, play equity meaning opportunity. Play equity for us is about ensuring that all youth have a chance to participate in recreational or competitive sports, despite gender, ability, skill level, where they live, or how much, uh, or how much money their parents earn. Uh, and we're working every day to close what we call the play equity gap. Uh, and I'll also uh, take a moment to uh, share uh, that I'm excited to talk about the just announced collaboration in response to the recent protests of all 11 LA area professional sports teams called the Alliance, which is uh, a comprehensive five year commitment to drive investment and impact for social justice through sport. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Nolan. I'm very happy uh, to hear more about the Alliance uh, as well. Uh, definitely relevant, I think, also for all of the parties that have been calling in. Um, and also, maybe there might be some nice opportunities to also collaborate on that. Um, and maybe Ges can reflect on that in a bit. Uh, let's first go uh, to Jason, because uh, Jason, probably maybe uh, the LA Lakers is also part of the Alliance. That, that's right. Yeah. And uh, Nolan took away one of my bullet points, but that's OK. That's one less topic. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, they've just joined the alliance, which is exciting. But I think the other step and once again, everybody, Jason Barquero, um, I, I play an interesting dual role because my day job, I've always said over the last 15, 16 years has been in higher education. So I've worked at various colleges and universities throughout Southern California, working with athletes, student athletes as well, of course. Um, and my passion is in professional and career development. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how that really, really segues into what we're talking about today and, and, and bringing that angle. Um, but also having my foot in, in, in sports as well. Um, you know, the Lakers, I think, made a very big statement also not too long ago in hiring a, um, a new head of diversity for the organization, right? In Dr. Karita Brown, who's now the new director of race and equity in action uh, for the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, a person who's an expert in that field from UCLA here in Southern California. And they've, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where people are putting their their money where, as they say, their money where their mouth is, right? We're investing in talent within an organization to take the lead on that. And uh, at my college, where I currently work at at Pasadena City College, and you're seeing this throughout different colleges and universities, um, they're making sure that there's a person at the seat at the table that has an eye and is really one step inside of this. Um, and I was recently involved in a conversation online where someone mentioned, well, you know, it, does it really matter if we have a head or a person with a fancy job title that has diversity in it? And, you know, is that the right response? And I said, well, okay, that, that maybe is, you're going to see a lot of that, I said, but it's important because what's happening in the boardroom and not just the boardroom of private uh, organizations, but the boardrooms of um, higher education institutions or any organizations is it isn't anyone's job. It hasn't been one person's job to really hone in on that. Um, of course, it's everyone's job. Uh, but Reese, all that to say that Pasadena City College, where I work at, also made an announcement that they will be hiring a chief diversity person to sit at the board. Um, so this is an example of how all organizations are saying this really needs to have someone at the lead at the head that day to day is reminding everyone, bugging everyone. It's, a, it's an agenda item at every boardroom conversation at every organization, whether it's a nonprofit or a private organization across the country and across the world. And so I'm very proud of that. Um, but the one thing I'll say, last thing I'll say about that, I think with the work that we're doing at Pasadena City College, um, especially in workforce development is, and I think this, this really is very true with our athletes. When we have young students that have come in, you know, 17, 18, ready for college or whether they're in their 20s or 30s, the one thing that they've told us is we need to see athletes, uh, professionals, whatever it is that they're doing, folks working in the sports industry like yourselves that look like me. And that's the number one thing. And so my department in our division and in our conversations in career development and across all industries, sports or anything else is, what do we look like? And are we, are we making a, an intentional effort of bringing folks to panel discussions such as this um, that come from different backgrounds, different race, uh, gender, and, and, and uh, from every corner of the world? And so uh, we've made an effort, my team and I, that this upcoming academic year, we're not only going to engage the different groups on campus, but at the same time, we're also going to engage um, companies and organizations all across Southern California and look for alumni and look for employers and recruiters that look like our students. So that our students, as they're growing and our athletes are growing, you know, they need examples. and they need to be able to say, that person looks like me, they speak like me, and so I can get there as well. And so that's really the mission um, that we carry, that I carry at our college um, in, in the corner of my world. And so um, I just wanted to, I wanted to share that with the group. Thank you so much, Jason. And I think, you know, that's the perfect stepping block also for his as uh, so the KMVB, the Dutch uh, Royal Soccer uh, Association, also heavily invests in youth programs. Um, so his, um, what, what, what could you share about the inclusion and diversity policies um, that you're, you're focusing on? Yeah, well, let's, let's first go back to the earlier speakers. I, I think I fully support their statements and, and their ideas. It's very strong, I think. And, but I want to go back to the first one and to the video. And, and to be honest, now I understand even more why 
Nike is just such a strong partner of, uh, of our association uh, because I think we feel we have the same DNA. And I think when you go back to the, to the, um, uh, to the youth programs you mentioned, our conviction is and our vision is, is that football is there for everyone. And uh, football is the most accessible sport in, in the Netherlands. I think on a, on a country of only 42,000 square kilometers, uh, with 80 million inhabitants, we have 1.2 million uh, members. So I think that's that's really a lot. You see, when I come to the to the club in my town, you see everybody there. All the kids of all the uh, all the different groups in in society are there and uh, playing together, uh, which is which is great. I think we put a lot of work on that so that every kid can play, that every kid gets a, a good coach uh, on his own level. Uh, I think if, if your parents don't have enough money, where, where, where the money is not often the problem in the Netherlands, I think the average, the average um, uh, a fee you pay for one year of uh, playing football is approximately 150 uh, euro, I think. But if you can't pay it, you can go to the, to the city council and lots of the time uh, they pay it. And there are some good foundations which can pay. So I think for making football accessible, that's great. Uh, but now coming back to, to the culture, of course, we also see some problems which we see in society. We also see them on our pitches and on our, on our grounds in the weekends. Um, and, and I think we're, we're becoming more and more, uh, we have to work more and more to make sure that we keep, the, keep it well on the, on the grounds and we work closely together with our national government, with the local governments, uh, also to take our responsibility. And I think in the past, so lots of the time we said, okay, we're just football and that's it. Uh, and I think we're, we're becoming more and more uh, a social organization. Uh, and, and I think uh, most of, of us and our colleagues are happy, happy to do so and they want to do so. So I think that's important. Uh, but I also want to uh, agree on, uh, on the words of Jason uh, before me. I think, when, well, when we look at our own organization, we still have quite a long way to go. We're now just started on, uh, on, um, on diversifying our organization. Uh, but as I said, uh, we still have a long way, way, way to go there. Um, that, that's for a start there, right? if that's okay by you. No, definitely. And you know, I'm also thinking uh, because um, Nola mentioned uh, and Jason, the Alliance. Um, and I know that reimaginefootball.com is way broader than innovations and technical innovation. It also goes about societal topics. And it also goes about, um, it's also about discrimination. So maybe there might also be an opportunity for all of you to connect uh, at a later stage. I think uh, that might actually be a beautiful synergy between the Alliance and then reimaginefootball.com when it comes to those societal uh, matters. Um, a lot has been brought up already, um, but I'm just gonna dive to the next question. And then during the Q&A, we can really uh, all flesh it out. Um, so maybe as as a next question, uh, Gabby, uh, what's Nike's approach when it comes to community activation? As this is one of the ways to reach socioeconomically uh, vulnerable communities, and how can you reach and support them? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, I think as uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we we really decide designed this made to play commitment to be inclusive and intentional. Um, you know, and as, as Nolan mentioned earlier, um, PE is a social justice issue, you know, so whether or not you participate in physical activity is really dictated by where you're growing up and how much income or your fam how much your family makes, um, or even your, um, your race and ethnicity, you know, and so especially from all the research that we see, you know, we see that active kids do better, right? They're more resilient, um, they do better academically. Um, they're more engaged in their communities, and they are, they're also more successful later on in their future careers. You know, so it's through our programs and partnerships where we're really trying to expand these opportunities to level the playing field. Um, and we think that if we can really make play and sport more accessible, uh, really to every kid, regardless of where you're growing up, um, you know, we can really get there. You know, and it's important for us to really focus specifically on marginalized communities. You know, and so uh, what we really do is we try to look across, um, you know, both a, a national level and some instances global, um, but also national and city level partnerships uh, to make this happen. Um, so, for instance, you know, we, we, we continue to build these um, digital training tools 
uh, to help parents, right? Parents, coaches, any caring adults um, that's supporting kid-centered play. And, you know, we know that this has been important and we're continuing to build that. It's become even more relevant these days, obviously. You know, as more of us were having to stay at home um, and more people are finding themselves stepping into the role of PE teacher. You know, so these digital tools and access to that are, are becoming super critical. You know, so in 2018, we uh, launched the How to Coach Kids app in partnership with the U.S. Olympic Committee, uh, really to really dig in, in that specific um, issue in terms of uh, providing free resources to everybody uh, to ensure that um, coaches and adults have the tools and training that they need uh, to make sure that they're delivering a positive experience for kids, you know, because just watching the game or having played it at one time does not necessarily mean that you might have all the tools that you need to make sure that um, you're providing a positive experience for kids. Um, you know, so when we looked at the app, you know, I mean, we, we expanded it across the, um, the US. Um, I mean, it's really available at, um, to everybody. Um, you know, but what we also saw is that, I mean, here in LA, um, the Latino community makes up the majority of the population. Um, we also have a lot of Spanish speaking households, you know, so it was very important for us to make sure that we also offered the curriculum in Spanish um, to remove any of the potential barriers that might exist um, and making sure that it was available to all. Um, in addition to some of the cultural responsive offerings, like providing the How to Coach Kids app in Spanish, you know, it's also critical for us that uh, we continue to provide these community relevant um, programs um, and programming. Um, you know, I think especially in these unprecedented times, there's just so much going on. And the reality is that there has been so much going on, specifically in marginalized communities. Uh, with kids going through just a lot of trauma in their lives. That's just been magnified and intensified with everything that's going on right now. You know, and what we're seeing is more research come out around the impact and this power that sport has and getting active and how that has the ability to heal the brain um, and heal kids and heal as they're uh, trying to overcome these traumatic experiences. You know, so as we really look at some of these marginalized communities, we're starting to go and navigate more into the space around how we make sure that um, we can also gear our coach trainings um, and offerings, uh, speaking specifically on a trauma-informed approach. You know, so, you know, through these ongoing initiatives and with Made to Play, uh, we continue to stay committed, you know, really uh, focusing on getting kids moving um, through play and through sport, uh, looking specifically at marginalized community, you know, because we really believe that if they can stay active and we can get them active and they can have a good time doing it, uh, that they can lead happier, healthier lives. Thank you so much, Gabby. I see a lot of talking points already that no doubt will come up with Hes in a bit, but I'd like to quickly swap the session a bit around as uh, Jason will have to leave us in five minutes, um, which also makes sense because we had to start with a delay. Apologies again for that. So I'd like to move over to uh, Jason at this point. And Jason, um, it would be great to learn a bit more about um, how you see uh, the role of community activation on the one hand, but at the same time, I'd also love for you to be able to point out um, what the most, what, what the project is that is closest to your heart. So um, I'm just gonna give the floor to you. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I think that in terms of project that's most dear, I think with community, you know, it's a couple of things, right? I think in the work that we do, and I think my encouragement for this group, uh, as I apologize, we'll have to step away at some point, is I think for us, as, as in, and as we we'll talk to our colleagues at other colleges and universities as well in programming, um, and now more than ever in Southern California, of course, is funding, right? And so we know that we cannot, uh, we can talk about programs, we can talk about the types of different events and things we want to do, but obviously with the kind of funding and, and the capacity um, that is necessary, it's, it's hard to execute. So I think it's going to be very important. I guess what's near and dear to me as I'm working with, with colleagues is how can we partner um, with private institutions, with private organizations, such as Nike, such as many others out there, um, and to be advocates for students and student athletes um, for corporate partnerships, correct? Where we can um, subsidize some of the things that we're trying to do and get off the ground. So higher education is a nonprofit, just like any organization, and, and we have limited budgets. And so I think our mission um, over the next year really is one, yet we have plenty of ideas and, and um, for what we want to do, but unless we have the backing, the capacity, the funding for it, it, it's hard to execute. And so I think what's passionate for me is how do we tell that story, right? How do organizations, how do we tell the story for folks? I mean, Nike obviously is a, is a pro, right? They've, they've been doing this for decades and they do an amazing job of telling their story. And I've seen it. We've had Nike come on campus before and, and they do a fantastic job of, of doing that. And so how can we take a model like that um, 
even if we don't have the Nike resources, but there's still a way to do it so that we can tell the story um, of those that, that need that kind of help and um, in order to provide equity and inclusion across the board, right? And so that's important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here because of, of Sasha and, uh, you know, my partnership with Sasha and working with him and, and his organization uh, down here in uh, my hometown of Downey, California, which is here in Los Angeles County. And Sasha, I have your mug here of Home Field Advantage that you gave me. And Home Field Advantage is a fantastic uh, local soccer organization. That, and you talk about, you know, what we're doing at a micro level, right, in terms of really going into the communities. We talk about Los Angeles, but then within Los Angeles, it's, it's a hub for all these micro communities um, that need help. And I'm using Sasha as an example, because the, what they do there and to impact the town, to work with other nonprofits in the town, to bring soccer to folks that traditionally may not have, can, uh, be able to afford uh, to play soccer, right, in the pay to play environment. So uh, for me to get involved with them and get involved with those organizations is, is a blessing and very, very important. And so that's what's near and dear to me and and that would be my message i think for everyone and for here for everyone to take on um is to get involved in one way or another we need people to get involved of all walks of life um you know I, last thing i'll say is oftentimes we look to folks that have the money to, to write a check and we need money <laughs> every organization needs needs someone that can write a check to help push those missions forward but even those of us that don't have the capacity to do that uh, we can still give time right we can give our time um, to, uh, to volunteer, to serve on a board and do that. So that's really what's near and dear to me to answer your question. Um, and I think what I'll be doing and with the people that I'll be working with and, and leading the team that I lead uh, back at my college is how are we getting involved with the community and do what we can, um, both to bring in volunteers, bring in folks that can provide those examples and those experiences for students and student athletes to take them out there and to do tours and, and work with different companies and provide equity. That's really how you're going to provide equity when you bring um, life to them so they can see uh, experiences that perhaps um, their family, quite frankly, does not have the capacity uh, to provide those experiences for them. And so I think it's a responsibility of us, us as professionals in this room to how do we provide those experiences, whether it's within sports or outside of sports, to those that traditionally don't have that opportunity, right? Where uh, mom and dad is not an executive at an organization and, and uh, I have that example in my family. Uh, so I'm going to look to my local community organization, um, my local college, uh, my school, my educators. And um, so I know maybe it's going off a little bit on a, on a soapbox, but it's a soapbox that's very important to me. And I think that's something that everyone has a capacity to, to do to give back is how are we going to give those experiences to, to, to everyone, to the youth? Um, really, that's where it starts. If you want to educate folks on diversity and, and inclusion, um, not that you're ever too old. <laughs> we're, all, we're all educating, we're all learning. But I think when you look at folks at an age where they're developing their minds and developing their skill sets, whether it's within sports or in the workforce, that's really a key, key group that we need to impact and keep in mind um, and get involved. Thank I hope you, that, that makes sense. It does, because when we talk about, you know, um, youth programs, when we talk about sports and making it accessible, it is necessarily intertwined with education and education, the classic institutionalized education or organizations, but also educating on the topic. So I think it's really nice how you've interwoven those two strands. I know you have to go. Thank you so, Sorry about so that. much. I have no, another no. meeting to run and I don't want my team to be upset. And so, I, but thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, uh, you know, and, and uh, the last thing I'll say I mean, to piggyback on that, I was going to add one more comment. You know, I remember in my days uh, when I was in graduate school and having those opportunities to intern for the LA Galaxy locally and intern for the Los Angeles Kings locally. And when you're in college and you think, you know, I don't have anyone that was ever even employed within those industries. But as a Latino myself uh, here in Southern California, my mother from Mexican descent, my father of Costa Rican descent, um, to get, get that access to walk into this big, beautiful stadium, right? I mean, I go to Dodger Stadium and Staples Center to watch a game, but to go behind the scenes for a minority like myself at a young age, see what it's like to work in sports, to be a part of sports, to walk the hallways, uh, to see David Beckham walk by me only about maybe 20 feet from me uh, back in 2008 or so, wearing a guy, that was very cool. And a lot of us take that for granted, especially if we've been in this industry and we see these folks and we, we're not awestruck. But let's not forget that at some point that, that those experiences are very, very powerful. Um, and those are the experiences that I would encourage the sports industry to provide for everyone. Um, so it motivates them 
um, to be involved. And then here we are, uh, many years later, and I'm with the Lakers. So it works. It really does work. So thank you so much, Jason. So long, I'd everyone. like to uh, move on to uh, Nolan. Nolan, um, your organization uh, obviously invests a lot in uh, programs and in grants. Um, Grant, uh, grants grants um, to activate communities and to activate youth. Um, what would be at the core um, for LA eighty four when it comes to community activation? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and you kind of set me up perfectly. So for for us, I, I just I want to take it back to uh, our Play Equity Initiative. Uh, it is something that we refer to as a movement, uh, the Play for All movement. Um, as a sports based youth development organization that works to help transform lives and communities through support of youth sports and structured play programs. This is really where our work and our focus is. And so I think it's important before I go any further to take a step back and, and simply uh, discuss or, or try to describe or explain what we mean or what we refer to when we talk about the play equity gap. What does that look like? Um, and so I, I think a good place to start is that, you know, in, in neighborhoods with high poverty rates, the gap is very prevalent and the opportunities to just play oftentimes just don't exist. Uh, there are, there, there, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, you know, barriers include the elimination or reduction of enrichment programs like PE programs or sports programs, having safe passage to safe playgrounds, to play spaces, fields, gyms, uh, a lack of, you know, a, a barrier for access could be a lack of trained or, or well-paid coaches or an existing uh, sports program. Then you have the rising costs of athletics and intramural programs, and that contributes to the, uh, to the pay to play culture. That's a major disadvantage to kids living in low income communities. They, they just don't have the money uh, to participate. And so then you see a trickle down effect, you know, as a result of these barriers and, these, and this gap, uh, we see troubling health data on our youth here in LA. 42% of low income youth are overweight or obese. 70% do not obtain the recommended amount of exercise each week. And this is data that's coming from the Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the second largest school district in our nation. Um, and so all that, you know, takes me back to just simply stating that play is a basic human right. And, and without access to sport and structured play, kids miss out on critical benefits that sports provides. Things like physical health, which, you know, Gabby pointed out earlier, uh, the social emotional growth and the academic development. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to prioritize and be strategic in terms of how we uh, provide support to the organizations uh, in our communities. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is, is kids spend most of their day at school. So, you know, L84 prioritizes supporting programs that meets kids where they are, particularly in communities that are under-resourced. Um, but but it, that's not the only way. I mean, sometimes we try to think outside the box a little bit, you know, and so the, the L84 Foundation tries to support sports biodiversity as another means to close the play equity gap. Um, you know, we realize uh, that um, it's simply about trying to just increase the participation level of kids in many different kinds of sport because not all youth are attracted to the mainstream sports, whether that be basketball or baseball or football here in the U.S., which is different from um, world football or soccer. Uh, you know, and, and so we've learned that more sports options simply equals more opportunities and therefore greater participation. And, and those are high priorities for us. And I'd also, you know, want to make sure I, I uh, highlight the fact that, you know, research shows that good coaching is an extremely important component needed for a successful youth sports program. Um, the positive relationship that is developed between the coach and his players is the foundation that will lead to good outcomes. And so, you know, part of our work also is to uh, provide training for coaches so that they understand how to best engage youth that they serve to achieve the best results. Thank you so there. much, Nolan. And I think you've set his perfectly up uh, with your ending. Uh, so I'm just gonna give it to his. But, oh, but also with his beginning, because I think I fully agree with Nolan that, that um, sports is a human right, uh, not only for kids, but for everybody. And I think if, if everybody would go to sport himself, I think that would cause a lot less problems in the, in the world, but it's, it's more, uh, personal uh, personal conviction. Um, I think our strategy has three pillars. The first one is, of course, what we discussed at the beginning. Make sure that all kids can play, that everybody can play. So good infrastructure, good coaches, good competitions, very accessible. So I think that's 
by far the most important. Uh, the second part is fighting racism. And uh, unfortunately, we did have um, uh, a bad, uh, of a big problem uh, with racist shunting of, um, of one of the stands last season. And I think we're really happy that together with the Ministry of Sports, with the Ministry of Social Development and the Ministry of Justice, we really make us, made a strong program for the next four years where we're going to do a lot on prevention, but also on, um, on identifying possible um, uh, betrayers and, and, um, and sanction them. So I think that's the second pillar. Uh, and the last pillar, the third one, is that we use big international events from UEFA or FIFA to uh, address different groups. Uh, groups which, which we normally are uh, uh, not easy to uh, get in contact with. Of course, there's a big development of the women's game in the Netherlands. So for 2023, we aim at, the, or we, we won the bid for the UEFA Champions League final, which will hopefully will also give a big, um, a big push again on the women's game. And uh, we have quite advanced pl plans already for, uh, for hosting the Women's World Cup in 2027. So I think that's important. But other target groups, which, which we don't easily have access to, are, for instance, um, uh, the Moroccan um, uh, uh, community in, um, uh, in the big cities in the Netherlands. So the, the urban youth, we, they don't come le like a lot of the Dutch people with their fathers or mothers to the clubs. So we try to reach them. And that was one of the big reasons why we wanted to host the UEFA um, uh, futsal, uh, uh, indoor soccer championship in, in 2023, 2022. And maybe it's good to, if you have still time left, Deborah, to watch the video which we made to really focus on the on the Moroccan community in the in the Netherlands. I think it's a beautiful video, and I say let's play it. And after, open the floor for two questions, and then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up the session. But um, I'm sure I, I really love the video, so let's just do it. You begin as a cup. Always. A ball, a goal, an opponent. The world is your territory. Breath or whistle, fans along the pitch, or otherwise you make them up. Play. That's all. A game. And then you get older, more serious. Nothing you can do about that. You become a lion. Do lions still play? It's all about the game. It's always just all about the game. Outside, inside, north, or south. This is what you have to remember. Make actions, make mistakes, make goals. Do whatever your heart tells your legs to do. Stay the child you once were, with your new ball, or your new shoes on the street, and then it got dark and your mother called because dinner was ready. Inside, she called. And you went, but not before you managed this one little trick, or made that last one. Stay that child. And at the same time, become a liar. And reclaim your territory. Come inside. Thank you so much, Hes, uh, for sharing this wonderful video. I think it wraps up really nicely a lot of points um, that have been raised already. Um, during the previous uh, conversation. At this point, I'd like to give the floor to the participants. Uh, we have time to take about two questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, and also, uh, I'll keep an eye out um, for questions, mainly with regard to how sports and inclusion also plays a role in uh, the legacy you're building towards uh, LA 2028 and where you see potential uh, parallels. And if I don't see any questions at this point, that means that it was all very clear, then I'll give the word back to the speakers for one last, really one minute pitch. Each of you, not even 30 second pitch, 30 second pitch. If we can do that of the project that is most dear to your heart, maybe just very, very briefly, just the title, what it is, and then the participants can look it up. So that would be great. So maybe Gabby, you can, you can start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the program that I think just really speaks uh, near and dear to my heart is Women Coach LA um, here in LA. 
Um, it's, it's a program, it's a partnership with the City of Los Angeles and the uh, Recreation and Parks Department um, in the city. Uh, and it's an effort to recruit, train, and place more female coaches uh, into youth sports leagues throughout the city. Um, super important to me. I grew up, you know, uh, you know, Latina in LA, um, wanting to play sports. Uh, parents didn't let me. Had to go try out for the volleyball team until when I was in high school. Uh, so I didn't get that chance until I was in high school, you know, but I do wonder if my mom would have felt a little bit more comfortable if she had known that there was a coach that looked like me, um, that spoke the language and that shared some more life experiences, you know, so that's one that stands out. Thank you, Gabby. I think that's a very powerful one uh, that I'm sure a lot of us can uh, relate to. Uh, Nolan. Sure, thank you. Um, I think uh, because of the timeliness of uh, the announcement that came out two days ago, um, I'd like to talk about the Alliance. Uh, it, it's a pretty exciting new initiative um, that came about following the recent protests nationwide, where again, the 11 uh, professional sports teams here came together and united to address racial injustice, develop educational opportunities, and, and create support uh, for other important issues facing communities of color, particularly the black and brown communities. Um, and so the Alliance is a five-year commitment to make a difference in these communities that are in need of jobs, educational opportunities, and hope. And so L84 is connected to the Alliance through a partnership um, with a couple of non-government organizations that includes the Play Equity Fund to manage this initiative here in LA. And so the initiative is going to be an advocate for social justice, address the disparities, as I talked about. But um, I think, as Jason mentioned, uh, just thinking about this initiative and the opportunities it'll create for, for folks like myself, like Jason, that uh, would have a chance to join organizations like these pro teams is, is something that I know for me uh, would have been just incredible. It, it would really create like a dream come true type scenario. So um, I, that I think why it excites me personally, because I think that if I was one of these young kids or a teenager in high school to have the chance to walk in and be a part of these organizations would just be unreal. Thank you, uh, Nolan. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Alliance is of interest to many of the people on this call and that they'll be very interested to follow up on that uh, with you. Then his uh, perspective from the Netherlands. Uh, of course, I wrote down that I'm very proud on our initiative uh, about the uh, inclusion of the LGBT community. And we did a lot of work on that in the last uh, eight years, I think in, in 2012, we were on the on the gay pride for the first time and we introduced inclusion in our programs um, in the last uh, years on our educational programs but i want to finish with our national team because i'm really proud of, of the guys of the team and the statements they made in the last months after the, the racist incident we had in the netherlands they made a very strong statement but also recently they made a real strong statements in the media uh, condemning uh, racism and I think that that's a great way that, that our athletes now becoming such a strong voice. And, and I think that's stronger than every program we, we can think of in, uh, in the Netherlands. So I'm really proud of, uh, of our national team. Thank you so much, Hes. Um, I'd like to conclude the session by thanking you all so much. This is just a very first uh, exploration of the topic. There will be more to come in the next eight years time. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by using uh, Gabby, if that's okay, the Nike uh, slogan of the Don't Do It ad. Let's all be part of the change. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For the participants, we'll start the next session, but we'll keep it short, so don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think it would be, um, Afka, would you mind maybe, is she still here now? Uh, I think it would be best if, if you could all uh, switch to the new Zoom environment because we'll okay. have new people dialing into that. Um, we'll do. I'll see you right, right there in five minutes, not even two, one. Bye. <laughs>